All right, you can turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to talk about sin versus science. Say, what? what kind of title is that? <laughs> Creative title, I guess. But uh, the question comes up, how should we witness to people that don't believe in God? You get these atheists, they come out and they say, what proof do you have that God exists? We need to see proof. Um, if you could just prove to me, scientifically, that there is some proof for your Bible or, or God or whatever else. And uh, Christians will get sidetracked by that. And I'm going to show you, it isn't about science, it's about sin. I'm going to show you that in this study. But this is one of the places that you'll be taken to by a Christian apologist, you know, apologetics type of ministries and things. Verse 15, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. All right, and they'll say, see, we're supposed to give an answer to every man. So that means somebody comes along and they have questions on evolution versus creation. We have to study that whole issue. Somebody comes along and they say, uh, what about uh, um, whatever kind of things, uh, astrology or astronomy, I should say. Well, astrology too, probably. But, uh, you know, all these different realms of science. And they say that uh, you, need to, you need to answer us according to science and things. And science is what it's all about because we're supposed to give an answer to every man. Um, that's not what it's talking about. You read the context of this. Let's keep reading verse 16 and 17. <clears throat> Down to 18 actually we'll read. Having a good, a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Christians act better, at least we should, real true Christians act better than lost atheists. A nation that is run with Christian principles, okay, when you have people holding the Bible in high regard, that nation will prosper. When you have an atheistic nation where the Bible is banned and forbidden, that nation will suffer and will never amount to anything. Communism has never worked. Verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Very good verse talking about salvation. But my point is, the context of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, is not saying we should study all manner of different sciences so we can give people answers according to whatever questions that they have. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, when somebody comes up to you and they say, what is the hope that's in you? Why are they saying that? Because they're sinners. They're saying, you're different. I see something different about you. What's this stuff you're talking about? This God and the Bible and whatever else? That's what the verse is saying. You give an answer to that person that comes to you, the man that comes to you and says, what's the hope that's in you? What is this, this thing that you have, this eternal life? That's what the verse is talking about. It is not saying that you give an answer to everybody's questions. That's just not there. What's our motivation for witnessing to the lost? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn there in your Bible. King James Bible. Don't mess with the others. They're from the Vatican. Proven in my a real Bible version issue. Exposed video on my secondary channel. You can watch that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. All right. What's our motivation? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We serve a God that is pure, that is perfect, that is holy. One that cannot, we cannot attain to his thinking. We cannot say, you know, it's, it's so funny, these atheists will prove to me, you know, show me God or prove to me about God or whatever else. What they want is they want to bring God down to their own level. They want to be able to experience God with their intellect. Uh, a God that can be experienced with your own intellect would not be worthy of your worship. A God that can, has basically your IQ would not have been able to create the universe. I mean, you can't create the universe. You can't bring people back to life, supernaturally speaking. God can. So, why would you think that God can somehow, he's somehow on your level? 
And these atheists, they'll come out and they'll say, well, you know, I just don't understand how a God could send, a holy, righteous God could send somebody to hell and burn them forever and ever and ever, torture them forever and ever. Uh, well, that's because you're not really being honest about how depraved mankind is. Uh, man is a very, very wicked creature. God in heaven created man with a free will, and man, more often than not, uses that free will to murder and steal and do all kinds of other terrible, horrible things. That's history. That's not my beliefs or my opinions or my feelings. That's history, documented history. Man has been a consistent failure all throughout history. So God has every right in heaven to say, if you don't accept my son, if you don't accept my plan of salvation, then I'm going to burn you forever and ever and ever. He has every right. And we as Christians need to keep that in mind. We don't come and say, well, you know, there's some really nice things about God and, and God is love and everything else. Uh, God loved the world enough to send his son to die, but if you don't accept that death of his son, his wrath is upon you. And his wrath is horrifying. And right now, the time of God's mercy is ending. And you're seeing judgment more and more and more. And God is cruel, absolutely cruel in His wrath. And if you're a Christian and you say, well, I just don't want to talk about that, you need to check yourself. That's an aspect of God. That's an aspect of your Father. You need to be careful about that. Our motivation as Christians is knowing the terror of the Lord. Knowing that God's going to send somebody who's lost down into a place called hell where they're going to be in pitch black darkness, outer darkness the Bible calls it, weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth and they're going to burn forever. Motivation, brethren. Let's see what Paul did. Turn back to Acts chapter 24. I don't think many people would argue that uh, the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian that ever lived. He certainly was. Let's see what his uh, witnessing tactic was. He was a very educated man also. Acts chapter 24, verse 24 says, And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, uh, or Drusilla, excuse me, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Paul gets an opportunity to witness. Verse 25, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season I will call for thee. That right there, that statement, verse 25, is the most used thing that lost people will do. A Christian comes to them and they don't say, Hey, let me show you some science tricks here and some neat little factoids about science and things like this. He said, he came to them and he reasoned of righteousness. See, God's righteousness gets rid of your self-righteousness. Temperance. How about that one for lost people? Temperance. Don't eat that. Don't drink that. Don't watch that. That's wrong. That's sin. Don't do that. Temperance. Lost people don't like that. These atheists, you know, you can't tell me what to do. And so I reject your book of, of you know, fairy tales and fib. Why? Because this book condemns what they're doing. And they know it. How about judgment to come? You're going to burn in hell forever. What do they say? Well, if they haven't killed their conscience yet, they'll say, well, I, I don't know, I'm just not ready yet, or I'm just, I don't know, whatever. They'll tremble. They'll get scared, and they'll say, okay, well, I don't want to talk about this. You know, let's change the subject, and they'll, I'll, I'll hear you some other time. I'll think about it, or whatever else. Yeah, absolutely. But again, you didn't uh, see anything in there about Paul saying to them, I'm going to use some scientific things, and, and let's talk about, you know, the bombardier beetle. Now, the bombardier beetle has two chambers in his 
tail section and they have two different chemicals that if they're mixed they explode and they do mix and they, they send out this little fire thing and stuff like this now how could that have slowly evolved see and the atheist goes oh yes that's very true hmm. and that stuff is good to encourage your faith as a christian to say wow our god is great our god is amazing sure god created nature to prove his existence all right we'll see about that later that's fine it should encourage you as a christian but to use those things to evangelize the lost, you're appealing to their intellect. You need to come to them and say, you're a sinner. Let's talk about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Turn next to Acts chapter 17. There's all these atheists out there, you know, they put up these videos and they go, you know, I have a challenge for Christians, you know, prove to me such and such. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're a sinner. You're going to go to hell, and you're going to burn forever. And again, this video is not to, to really convict atheists and things like that. This video is for you, my brethren out there, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm trying to tell you the best way to witness to an atheist is not with science. It's about sin. We'll see it here again, Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, we'll see the tie-in with this later, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Don't look to organize religion with their church buildings, with their little temples, that's not where God's at. Still true today. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to, life, to, to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Hmm. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, gra graven by art and man's device. Paul's rebuking what they're doing. They have altar to the unknown God and things like this, and they're trying to find God through, we can worship maybe a statue or something. Paul's rebuking that. He's saying that's idolatry. He's judging them. Mm -hmm. Verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at. What you're doing here, God winked at that. But now commandeth all men everywhere to turn from unbelief to belief. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's what Jack Howes taught the sick pervert that he was. No, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Paul goes in, he judges them, he says, you're too superstitious, what you're doing is wrong, you ought not to think that God is worshipped in temples and things, and th things made with hands, organized religion isn't going to do it, your system is not going to do it, you're a bunch of deluded pagans, and God's going to judge you, and you better repent. If you could break it down and make a short little thing of what Paul said to them. What's the reaction? Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Hmm. Just like Felix did later on in the book of Acts. Uh, when I have more convenient season, I'll call for you. I'll hear you again of this matter. Maybe I'll hear this again sometime, and whatever. Verse 33, So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was Dionysius and uh, the Areopagite, 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 excuse me, I can't talk this morning, and a woman named De Damaris and others with them. It's very early. Excuse me. <laughs> Mouth hasn't quite gone yet. But my point is here, brethren, he's right there with pagan philosophers. 
does Paul go in and say, you know, let's let's talk about, I want to do a little presentation today on creation versus evolution and things. And, you know, these pagan philosophers would have believed a lot of the evolution fairy tale, right? Evolution is not a scientific theory. It's an ancient pagan philosophy. You study some of the early philosophers that came out with the evolution nonsense. It's, it's just a, it's a pagan philosophy is what it is. All right. It's not science. Never has been. And, you know, you can get into the whole creation versus evolution thing. But again, that's, that's not supposed to be used to lead people to the Lord. You intellectually overpower them through debating and things like this. And they go, I have no other choice. The evidence is just so overwhelming. I have to become a Christian now. That isn't going to do it. It's about sin. It's about judgment. That's what it's about. Don't get pulled away from that as a Christian. These atheists come along and they say, you need to prove God exists to me. You say, uh, are you a sinner? I've done this thing over and over and over again with atheists, you know, and, and you know, I'm an atheist. You know, it's like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I'm supposed to respect that. You're a fool, the Bible calls you, if you're an atheist. You know, I'm an atheist and things. And I say, okay, are you a sinner? They'll never say, yes, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. Never say it. Never say it. I reject your book. I reject this. I reject that. You have to prove to me scientifically. Why? Because they want to bring God down to their level so that they can say, well, he's really not much better than me. The thought of a holy, righteous God that is so perfect that he cannot allow sin in his presence unless that sin is paid for by the death of his own son. And if you don't accept that death of his son, he burns you forever and ever and ever and ever and laughs at you. They don't want to think about that. But that's the God of the Bible, whether you choose to believe it or not. Okay, now go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 32. Let's read this here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Compare to that to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. God sends them strong delusion that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Something to think about. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah, they say it in their heart. It's a feeling that they have. Another one of the lies that the atheists come out with, they'll say, everybody's born an atheist, you have to be educated into religion. That's an absolute total lie. I mean, there are some times they just say, they, they make some stupid idiotic statement, and then they say, prove us wrong scientifically. <laughs> uh, you're a liar. You're a liar. The Bible says that everybody is born, and they have a belief that there is a God. God gives you a conscience when you're first born. You have to kill that conscience later on. Nobody's born an atheist. All it takes is just a quick look at nature, and you go, there's no way that that happened by chance. No way. Absolutely not. You have to be told by some wicked Luciferians out there that everything happened by random chance. Now you can go on living in your sin. You have to be told that. But what do they do with all this, uh, you know, worshiping the creation and things? Let's look at this. Verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man... That's what they want to do again. See, they want to take God and they want to make him like corruptible man. And the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It's kind of funny because God lets them have what they want. 
and they get mad at God for saying, you know, hey, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. You ought to just let us have our way. God says, okay, you can have your way. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen to you, by the way. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Sodomy is the final sign before God's judgment comes. You say, well, man, there's a lot of sodomy in my country. I better go to another country. Well, that's right. There's pretty much sodomy in every country now. And the Vatican hirelings in government are making sure that laws are passed to protect sodomy and to perpetuate it. They want to spread it. Why? Because Satan is going to hell. He's going to the lake of fire. He's going to burn forever and ever and ever. And he wants to bring as many people with him as he can. So the best way to do it is to get people into sodomy. Nothing will bring God's wrath on a country quicker than sodomy. I mean, the very term, sodomy, is the sin of Sodom. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. Interesting, because that's what they want to draw you into as a Christian. Deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. Hello, atheists. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, this is where the judgment is. This is what you use for the lost people. And what they want to do is they want to draw you back into the thing of, you have to scientifically prove to me. Prove this, prove that. And when you, <clears throat> if you ever see this, if you ever do this with an atheist, where you actually will try to, you know, Show them, well, actually, if you study this and you study that and whatever else, you'll never convince them of anything. Never. It's a rather dangerous thing to get away from preaching righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord we persuade men. And you get away from that and you start to say, well, I need to you know, show them science and I need to show proof of this and proof of that. No, you don't. All you need to do is are you a sinner? Your sins are going to be judged someday. You say, well, I reject the book. Okay. Then have at it. Take the gamble. Simple. Oh, no, but brother, I, I, I have to, to win them to the Lord. And if I don't, their blood's going to be on my hands. That's a whole other thing that you're going to hear. Uh, not at all true. If you have to actually go back to Ezekiel where that passage is where it talks about, you know, warning the wicked to turn from his wicked ways and things. And if you don't, then his blood's going to be required at your hands and all this. It's not for a Christian. Because if you look at the context, it's actually talking about if you don't warn them, then your soul, you actually lose your soul. So if you apply that to a Christian today, then if they don't witness to every lost per person that they meet and their blood's on their hands, then they could actually lose their salvation because of not witnessing. The Baptists and, and a lot of the others and things, but mostly the Baptists, have really put this thing of ultra soul winning on the brethren because they're trying to get the numbers in so they can get the money. Grow the bigger church building. So it's just win souls, win souls, win souls, win souls. Don't do anything else but win souls. Get them in here so we can get their money. And they've perpetuated this thing for so long that they twist scriptures to make you feel like you're just scum of the earth if you've not won 12 people to the Lord in, in the last hour. It's ridiculous. Our job is to preach righteousness, temperance, judgment to come. That's what we're supposed to do. And if people reject that, 
That's their problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 through 21. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Hmm. Wisdom of words? Let me talk about science to you today. Uh-uh, it's about sin. You see? It's about the cross of Christ. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Very simple thing that you can say to people. They say, I'm not a bad person. Okay, then who did Jesus die for? You get in because you're not a bad person? Did he die for the really bad people? You know? He didn't die for your sins. He just died for those that are much worse, apparently. I mean, if Jesus, you know, he dies on the cross, if you can earn your salvation, why on earth did he do that? Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? If God's made foolish the wisdom of this world, then what on earth are you doing trying to use that to witness to the lost? Hmm. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You're going to look like a fool. Oh no, I because, you know, I've gone to the university and I have a PhD. Let's all welcome Dr. whoever. And um, he's a very highly educated man. He taught high school science for 15 years. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he's he's been this great professor and he's been this and he has foreign degrees and, and all these other things and, and uh, you know, he's debated some of the top evolutionists in the country. And No, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. And you can't make it different than that. I was going to say unfoolish. I don't know if that's really a word. <laughs> it's foolishness. But you see, when somebody's broken, when their pride is finally broken and they come down to that level and they're just like, I just um, I can't continue like this. I don't know what's going on. My life is just a wreck. Everything's falling apart. God, if you're real, I need help. They're ready for salvation. You see? And you hear, and all of a sudden they hear and they say, <clears throat> the Bible says that you're going to go to hell if you die in your sins. And you get that fear coming in you and you go, hell? You mean I'm going to, it gets worse than what I'm going through right now? I'm going to burn forever on top of this? And then you hear the good news of the gospel. Jesus died for sinners. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for you, sinner. All those things that you struggle with, all those things that you are, you just mess up and mess up and mess up. He died to pay for all of that. His blood can wash that all away. That's the good news. Not saying, well, actually all the earthquakes out there in the world right now, there, there's all these big earthquakes and the Bible says that there would be earthquakes in diverse places in the end times. And, uh, you know, let's look at the seismic activity of the last three months or th things like this and, and whatever. And, I, and you know, I'll, I'll admit I've probably been guilty of some of this, you know, the apologetics type of stuff where you try to show lost people proofs of things and stuff like that. It's not supposed to be that way, brethren. It's about sin, not about science. Matthew chapter 11. Let's kind of talk a little bit about this, but we'll continue here. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it, it seemed good in thy sight. God hides certain things. You know, Jesus spoke to the masses, the, the great groups of people and things. He spoke to them in parables. 
he could have just come down and just said simply, hey, I'm, I'm God, here I am. You want to see some science? You want to see some uh, proof and things like this? Okay, you know, whatever, done things. And he did, by the way, some of that stuff. And yet the people still didn't believe. We'll see that as we continue. But God hides things from the wise and prudent. Interesting. Verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. You can't say, I believe in God, but I reject Jesus Christ. It doesn't work. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The hardest thing you can go through as a Christian is still better than living out there in the lost world. And all the junk you go through as a lost person. And notice there it says, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. When the Lord saves you, He puts a yoke. You're a bondservant now. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. That blood that was shed on the cross, that was the purchase price to purchase you. Or the, the price that was paid to purchase you, to say it that way. You don't have the right to say, hey, I'm not going to this, I'm not going to that. I'll just do what I want with my life. You don't have that right anymore. But notice it says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And I've said this many, many, many times throughout my sermons, and that is, the way that you judge if somebody's really truly saved is what is their attitude towards the truth. I'm a Christian, but I reject the King James Bible only position. Um, I'm a Christian, but I'm not dispensational. I'm a Christian, but I believe Christians would go through the time of Jacob's trouble and could lose their salvation. And, and you know, But I'm still a Christian. Sorry. Nope. Nope. I'm a Christian, but I don't have to change my life. Well, then you're not taking the yoke of the Lord upon you. You're not a bondservant. You do what you want with your life. But you've believed and that's all it takes. Your own belief. It's really something, isn't it? Again, do we see science? No. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not to come unto me, all ye that are convinced by the mighty arguments of my saints down there, proving scientifically that I exist. Uh-uh. Are you laboring? Are you heavy laden? Come to me, I'll give you rest. And he will, and he does. Luke chapter 16. An old saying is very, very good, and that is, a man can't be saved until he knows he's lost. Absolutely. Luke chapter 16, verse 27. You have the rich man in hell, and he sees Lazarus over in Abraham's bosom. This is talking about the Old Testament here. Before Jesus died on the cross, now when Jesus, you know, now that the blood is there, you go right to heaven when you die. You don't have to go down into, you know, the earth down there to wait for the resurrection. You don't need to do that. Or wait for Jesus to die on the cross, the perfect redemption. Luke chapter 16, verse 27. This is the rich man speaking here. It says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Lazarus, in other words. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. It's a prayer of a lost relative that went to hell. They're praying. They're saying, please, God, I want them to be saved. I don't want them coming here. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. At the time the New Testament wasn't written, Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets, they have the Old Testament, the Word of God. He doesn't say, well, you know, there's a lot of scientific proof out there that will point people to God. The Bible, they have the law, the Ten Commandments to convict them that they're sinners, that they need to get saved. Verse 30, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. They need to see scientific proof. And he said unto the, him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, 
neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Exactly. You can show people scientific proof and waste your time. Because if they're sinners not wanting to be saved, you aren't going to convince them of anything. Turn back to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there's no longer going to be any atheism. It will be true Luciferianism, which is exactly what atheism is. did a video on that. People that are atheists, predominantly, I mean, there's some that might have just never heard the gospel yet, but those that have heard the gospel, those that mock the gospel, hate the Bible, they're Luciferians. That's all that they are. They are Satan worshipers. But you see, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the mystery of God is going to be finished. They're actually going to believe. I believe that they're actually going to be able to see God. They're going to know that God is real. Scientific proof, you know. Turn to Revelation chapter 16. What happens when they see God? <clears throat> well, towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, you have the outpouring of the vials of wrath. Let's see what happens when these people are seeing God and they know God is real. They know that He exists. Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shall be, shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another uh, out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. All right. <clears throat> is there any doubt that this stuff is supernatural? When these events occur, there will be no doubt. None. And again, you know, let me kick another little thing while I'm at it here. You get to all these people that are into uh, Reformed theology, and they'll try to tell you, and Catholicism. Catholicism and Reformed theology are just, you know, pretty much the same thing. But uh, <clears throat> anybody that's Reformed theology, uh, scratch them, don't even listen to them. But they'll tell you that all these events of Revelation happened in the past. Really? All the water on earth turned to blood? Men had to mark the beast and, and they had a noisome sore and things like that? Well, that's symbolic. <laughs> Just of the devil. Wicked, stinking people. Absolutely disgusting. But the atheists, they say, we need to see scientific proof. There it is. The mystery of God's finished. They understand that God's real. They can see Him, I believe. And God's pouring out supernatural miracles upon the earth that you can't explain away with science. Well, it's global warming. It's climate changers. No, no. He's doing miracles. <clears throat> Verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now look at this. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. They know that God is real, and they hate him. Scientifically proven to them that God is real, and they still hate him. Verse 10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. That's where we're going to end it. That's the whole issue, brethren. They don't want to repent of their deeds. They don't like you coming along and uh, talking about righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. They can't stand that. And so they will sidetrack you and they will say, 
does, don't some of your own apologists and your, your own Bible there, doesn't it say that you're to give an answer to every man? Hey, I'm just asking for some scientific proof that your Bible is true and that God is real. Don't fall for it for one second. Are you a sinner? I reject the book. Then go to hell. Simple as that. Well, but 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 I, I need if you could just show me show me some proof. If I just had a little bit of proof, then I could believe in God. No, no proof. Are you a sinner? Do you have uh, heavy labor? Are you depressed? Do you have problems in life? Then Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Are you willing to have the yoke of the Lord put around your neck? Oh, that's so demeaning. That's so terrible. Oh, I can't believe such a terrible picture to these African slaves being chained up by the hands and they got the yoke around their neck and they got, they're being led along. But what if you were being led along by the Lord? I don't mind having His yoke upon me. I don't mind it when the Lord says, Hey, son, I don't want you drinking that. Don't look at that, please. Don't eat that. Because you see, when I listen to my Heavenly Father, and He tells me don't do that, and I listen, my life gets better. I like His yoke to be around my neck. I like the restraint. So, that's, that's just so demeaning and terrible. Okay, go to hell. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, I just need proof. You're not going to get any proof. You're a sinner. You don't come to the Lord His way and say, I know I'm a sinner. Then you go to hell. It's very simple. Extremely simple. Uh, you don't need to come up with all kinds of proof and study science and study creation and evolution and this all the debate back and forth and, and whatever else and, and textual criticism and all that stuff. That stuff is secondary. It all goes back to the very simple thing. Are you a sinner? That's what we preach to the lost. And if they reject that, it's on them. You've done your job as a Christian. We are to go out and to preach righteousness, temperance, judgment to come. And that's why they hate us too, by the way. We're the uh, spoil sports, the uh, party poopers, the goody two-shoes, the narrow-minded, bigoted whatevers. Because we judge their sins. They come out and they say, Look, we're so advanced now. We have sodomite marriage, gay marriage, you know. LGBT, we're so we're so cool and, and we, we just, you know, anybody can use any bathroom that they want to and you can dress however you want to and perversion is is wonderful. And I often think to myself, you know, these, these sex perverts out there, these dirty, filthy sex perverts, is there a level that's going too far with sex perversion? I mean, is there something that they would consider to be wrong and immoral and filthy? See? And the answer to that is no. If they're honest, they'd have to say no. Because a man raping a child or something like that, well, he's just, that's his way of expressing love for the child, you know? See? What's the level that you say, okay, this that's going too far? When you get into the mindset of, there should be no boundaries. There should be no limitations. But we as Christians have to be there to say, hey, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You're going to stand before a holy, righteous God someday, atheist, and if you are not saved, if you haven't put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and, and had a changed life that comes as a result of true conversion, His yoke is put upon you and you learn of Him, if that yoke isn't there, if you're not a bondservant of Jesus Christ, if He isn't telling you what to do, if there has not been any change there. And you see that all the time with these atheists too, by the way. I was raised in church, I prayed the prayer, I was a Christian, but now I'm not anymore. Well, according to some of the brethren, the easy believers and people, they say that, well, they were, they're were they saved. They'll be in heaven because they at one time believed. It doesn't matter that they're totally wicked now and they hate God. It doesn't matter because they believed. They made a profession that they are saved 
and therefore they're saved. No changed life necessary, just a profession. Doesn't work. So, just wanted to do this little study here quickly just to show Christians out there, don't get sidetracked by this atheistic thing of, I need to see proof. And if you could just show me some proof, if I just saw some proof that the Bible was real and some scientific evidence, you have to have scientific evidence, you know, because I need to be able to test God. I need to be able to bring God into the laboratory and sit him down and say, you know, okay, now I have some questions for you, okay? Now, if you answer these questions correctly, then I'll accept your plan of salvation. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're a filthy sinner, atheist. That's what we preach to the atheists. You're a sinner. You're going to be judged. If you die in your sins, you're going to go to hell and God is going to burn you forever and laugh at you. Read Proverbs chapter 1. He will mock when your terror comes. That's what the Bible teaches. Let's stay focused, brethren. We have to judge sin. That's one of the reasons that we're here on this earth. We shouldn't just say, well, you know, whatever people want to do, just kind of let things fall apart and whatever else. Nope. We need to judge sin. Don't worry about trying to lead people to the Lord with scientific proof. It's about sin. And if they reject that, if they say, oh, I'm not a sinner, I reject your book, you, you haven't proved, go on to somebody else. Okay? That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.